All right, well, good morning. Uh, my name is Sarah Dimson. I am a Masters of City Planning and International Development Group candidate. And welcome to the first ever um, MIT Energy Initiative and Department of Urban Studies and Planning Urban Africa Group event. Um, first and foremost, on behalf of DUSP Urban Africa, I'd just like to thank Mighty in particular and uh, Dr. Rob Stoner um, for their incredible support for this event. Um, secondly, um, thank you to our distinguished panel for your time and your participation. Um, it is definitely a power panel of great minds, so thank you all uh, for being here. Um, the agenda is here. Um, I'd also just like to point out that there is a sign-in sheet going around the room, and if you're interested in learning more about the initiatives of Urban Africa, please note your contact information. Um, we are having another event on September, uh, excuse me, on November 30th, um, and participants from Slum Dwellers International will be here. Um, so we are gathered here today because uh, Africa is rising and countries across the continent are experiencing steady economic growth and rapid urbanization is occurring across Africa's emerging market cities. And I think this confluence presents some amazing opportunities and also some real challenges. And just south of Dar es Salaam, uh, Tanzania, uh, the region is, uh, that we are focused on today is Matwara. Uh, and we are fortunate enough to have uh, Joseph Simbiaka, uh, who is the regional commissioner of the Matwara area. It is a relatively unknown and largely undeveloped rural area that is attracting a lot of commercial and enterprise interest given the recent uh, hydrocarbon uh, discoveries. So the big question is uh, how can Watwara and the region best leverage the boon of uh, natural gas towards equitable redevelopment? And answering this question obviously uh, requires um, the meaning of great minds and it also requires a lot of willpower by local government. And so I am pleased that Joseph has chosen to join us today um, at MIT. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Rob Stoner, who is going to moderate today's panel discussion. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, everyone who, uh, who is here with us for joining and those who will view us in the future live. I'll remind you that this, this is being videotaped. And um, our speaker has informed me that uh, his report will take the form of a video, which he'll hand over to the president of his country. And so uh, please be on your best behavior. No unpresidential <laughs> remarks. And I'll try to do the same. I'd like to thank Sarah, who uh, really has done a brilliant job in organizing this, um, far out of proportion to what would reasonably ex be expected of any, any student. She uh, took control of it. And when she realized how incompetent an organizer I am, and has carried the ball the entire length of the field, and, uh, and many kudos. Um, my wife uh, sent me out the door this morning, handed me my peanut butter sandwich, and patted me on the head and told me that I mustn't talk about politics, um, although there are certainly opportunities. And it's a pleasure to have a microphone <laughs> on a, a day like this. But it did, um, it did occur to me that, that just four years ago, on a similar occasion, uh, I was living in Tanzania uh, and sitting on the couch in our little house looking out over the Indian Ocean with our uh, office staff watching uh, the returns come in from the uh, most recent election before this. And it was a special time. And a special time for, for the world, but also a special time for us uh, as a family. We were living there because uh, we had decided to take a bit of a break in our lives. and go to Africa to try to learn about what was going on and how we could play a role uh, during that period and, and, and at other times in our lives as well, as we all can. And we learned a great deal. And one of the things we learned, one of the things I learned as someone who is preoccupied with energy, is that energy is an enormous constraint in Africa on economic development. Uh, it prevents people from being able to acquire fertilizers easily. It means that they can't get around in their cars. Uh, as Amy Rose, who's working on power systems in Africa, knows, uh, it's a constraint on the ability of, of uh, African utilities to generate power, which makes it very difficult to run industries, 
to educate people, to get around, to run telecommunication systems. Energy is the key ingredient that has been missing from the development plans of many African countries uh, for many years. Now, that isn't to say that some African countries haven't had the opportunity to make use of substantial fossil resources and accelerate their development. And they have, to some degree, succeeded, and in other cases, uh, disappointed. Uh, there's a great deal that has to be put in place to manage effectively the production and sale of hydrocarbons that are produced. And it means that governments have to build up new uh, agencies. Policies have to be put in place. Infrastructure has to be developed. Banking must be developed. Relationships with foreign banks and foreign governments must be put in place. It all takes time, and it follows a, uh, a very challenging path. This morning, our speaker will be addressing a, a critical and, I, I think, a surprising topic for many, and that is the very large discoveries of natural gas that have been made off the coast of East Africa over the last several years. And when I say several, I mean year. Uh, it, it, this, there's been a sudden uh, uh, growth in the proven reserves uh, off the coast of Mozambique and southern Tanzania. Uh, and that has meant that Tanzania has gone from being a country with essentially no fossil resources, a very, very small uh, uh, producing reserves in Sanga Sanga, to potentially a very large producer uh, with the possibility of profound impacts on, A, its access to cheap energy, but also the production of um, foreign reserves that could be used in various ways to accelerate its development and change uh, profoundly its relationship with the rest of Africa and the rest of the world. Just at the beginning of this year, uh, the first of these, these sorts of um, uh, discoveries were, were reported. And by June, I think, the, the, the reported reserves had reached a total of about 28 trillion cubic feet. Uh, people who don't think about trillion cubic feet a lot, and it's hard to think about a trillion cubic feet, uh, maybe need a bit of a scale for, to, to, to put that in context. 28 trillion cubic feet is more natural gas than the United States consumes for all purposes in a year. Um, so that's a lot of natural gas, and that's just what's been found so far. As Joseph pointed out to me at breakfast this morning, the proven reserves are reported to be higher and higher practically with each passing week and may well be in excess of 100 trillion cubic feet uh, as part of a large block offshore that, that may be more than 500 trillion cubic feet. That is a lot of gas by any standard and would make us a very large global producer. Tanzania's current consumption of, of natural gas is 200 million cubic feet less than five, or more than five orders of magnitude less than, than that uh, volume of proven reserves. And that means that what Tanzania produces uh, will be in large part exported, I think it's fair to say. Uh, with the abundance of natural gas in this country uh, and the low prices that have resulted from that, I think it means that most of the exporting will occur in the form of liquid natural gas, liquefied natural gas, to Asian countries. And so Tanzania will be looking to the east, uh, establishing diplomatic relationships and trade relationships with countries that it has not historically had relationships with, all of which will change the course of its future and, and the way it conducts itself uh, in, in, in business and uh, diplomacy. It's a fascinating situation and one that I hope this brief forum will entice people into becoming more involved with. And uh, I hope that we'll develop some research relationships and relationships with students and Joseph and his colleagues. And so let me uh, very briefly amplify Sarah's introductory comments. This is Colonel Joseph Simbakalia, uh, who is going to be speaking with us today. He'll make remarks of about 20 minutes. Uh, that will be followed by a panel discussion, also of about 15 to 20 minutes. 
uh, and I'll introduce our panelists after uh, Colonel Simbokulia's remarks. And then I hope we'll have an opportunity for questions from you. Uh, so please keep track of things that you'd like to ask about, and, and we'll make an effort to leave time to address them correctly at the end. Colonel Simbokulia is a career Tanzanian Army officer. Uh, has served in many roles and was identified early on as a, uh, a gifted person and has been uh, brought up by the Tanzanian government to uh, uh, learn skills that have enabled him to, to lead in uh, many different domains. I think when he retired, he might have had some hope that he would have an opportunity to perhaps put his feet up and fish uh, or at least take some vacations, but instead he's landed himself in one of the most challenging situations one could find oneself in in Tanzania, and that is as the district commissioner of the region of Mutwara, which is in the south, very close to the offshore gas fields, and where the offshore gas will come ashore, at least in large part. That means he faces the significant challenges of figuring out how People will be accommodated, uh, international companies will come into the area, uh, how infrastructure will be built to accommodate them, uh, how gas will be moved in and out, where ports will be built, where roads will be built, how oil revenues will be apportioned. It's a tremendously complicated task, and we are fortunate that he's joined us today to, uh, to describe it. And so uh, with one further comment, I'll hand off to Joseph. I'd point out to those here who speak Swahili, and I don't know if anyone does, one. Two, of course, um, that Simba is the Kiswahili word for lion, and Kalia is the past imperfect, whatever, has, has roared, is what it means. So the lion has roared is Simba Kalia. <laughs> I think that uh, his name is incorrect. Uh, if I spoke better Swahili, I, I think I'd uh, probably rename him, rename him, in, him and I'll say it in English, the lion is about to roar. Uh, and so I invite Colonel uh, Simba Kalia to come forward. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you, Robert, for the introduction and kind words. A special word of thanks to Sarah for the good work that you've done, and actually to both of you for making all this possible. I'd like in advance to thank the audience, the distinguished panel, which has found time to, to be with here tonight, uh, this morning. Um, well, let me say a word about the last remarks that uh, Rob made about Roaring Lion. Actually, those who come from our part of the world and are familiar with lions, they know that a roaring lion is not dangerous. It means his head is filled and is just bragging. It's, it's, it's a quiet one. That's, that's, a, that's the one you want to watch because it bounces on you. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I'm going to spend the next 18, 19 minutes or so um, to make a presentation about Mtwara. Mtwara, even in Tanzania, and recently, was the, the backwaters. If you sent to Mtwara, you basically, in England, they say you sent to Coventry. Or in old Russia, there will be sort of Siberia, you know, go and perish. But not now. Mtwara has suddenly become very famous. Everybody wants to go to Mtwara, even in Tanzania. And uh, men would consider a privilege to be in the position that I am, as regional commissioner of Mtwara because of the huge find of hydrocarbons that have been told about. How much, as I say, the figure keeps changing every day. Um, if you look at the, at the reports of the nine holes that have been drilled, I say for golf players, it would say it's every time one swings a, a club, it's a hole in one. Out of 10, there's only been one dry, dry hole. So, you know, as you say, it's every time people go down when they come up, the figures change. So we're going to have this huge reserve of natural gas. What does that mean? And the reason I'm here is that energy, gas, oil, is, is a global resource. It's, it's found in some location, you know, wherever, but it's a global resource. And because of that, 
you know, geopolitics kicks in, uh, global economic issues kick in, for the reason that you need, you know, global resources, be it human capital, be it technology, be it finance, uh, to make it happen. And of course, global markets, when you have that kind, that scale of, uh, of, of, of production. So, you know, and now start looking locally. Um, it comes like a tsunami. It's a deluge. Nobody knew until maybe a year and a half, two years ago, that we had so much gas. So it comes without warning to a country that has no tradition of industry and much less oil and gas industry that would give you the skills base, the, the, the commercial network, the support services for that industry. So you're starting from there. Uh, it's, it's going to be a deluge in, 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 in terms of revenues that typically you know, you, you'd receive out of uh, when you make such discoveries when such industry grows. And then it's a challenge. How do you manage that? How do you make sure that you have maximum distributive impact? Uh, what policies should be in place? Let's say if you didn't have it before, then what, what do you do to your legal framework to, to make sure that, you know, uh, there, there are benefits, that the environment is protected, that local people benefit. I could go on and and end. But I would like up front to say something. I don't know if it was meant as a state secret. Probably not. When I was being sent to Mtwara, this is about a year ago, um, but the president the prime minister said in his many words, that you go into Mtwara, one thing we don't want to see is a huge, you know, squatter growth. And Dar es Salaam right now is being challenged, really, the way it's growing, you know, with traffic, people, and, and you know, the infrastructure really choking. And so that's one of great challenges that we face because, I mean, people are not going to wait and say, well, you know, where is your plan? When are you going to start building? And people are already there on the ground. The pressure is already on. So I'm very pleased that uh, DUSP, MIT, is, is, is very much involved in this as much as the uh, MIT initiative. Oh, I'm supposed to. This one? Yes. Ah. Well, this is what I was saying, that uh, Mtuara is poised to be a new high growth pole for the country, for the region, uh, because of the world class offshore and onshore natural res gas resources which have been discovered. But plus the fact that Mtuara is a very good natural port. So the industry has selected, because of geography and because of the port, to make it the hub for supplying and servicing the oil and gas industry along the eastern seaboard. So it's, it's, it's both going the production, the logistics, and hopefully later on also the, uh, the petrochemical industry cluster that's going to come up. So this is, say, this is the view from outside. Uh, this map just shows you the level of activities uh, in the region. You see, those are all the blocks for oil and gas in the whole country. If you have to show Mozambique, just south of Mtwara, which one is the laser, laser beam? This one. Ah, Mtwara is there, and that's the most border, common border with Mozambique. There's a lot of gas which has been pounded here. Yeah? I think the figure is around 100 TCF now. So all that is Tanganyika territory. And there is more on this side. I think um, Madagascar, someplace. But this is a picture. This is what's happening on shore. And, and you can see that you know, going to the future, um, the country has great challenge just how we're going to manage all that. Now, from inside, it's not like 
we didn't have any plans or did not we were going to do the Mtwara. Um, the region which has been delineated as the Mtwara Development Corridor, say, straddling a number of countries, is a region that was known to have um, a lot of resources in terms of agricultural land, in terms of industrial minerals. Gas was not in the equation. But fig everybody thought that um, one could actually tap those resources and, and, and stimulate development by doing two things. First of all, putting a backbone of infrastructure in the region, which then would open up the region, give it access to international markets, and then gets a wheel turning. And this, this, was, this was the dream. Um, I first got involved in the Mitra Development Corridor in 1999. That's when we had our first uh, regional meeting. And then it developed further. And so, as I say, you know, a, a geographic uh, area was defined by the four countries. And it was actually planned under the auspices of uh, Southern Africa Development Co Co Corporation as a regional spatial development initiative. And the idea was if we're going to drive regional integration, integration, it's not going to be around politics. Yes, you need political basis to do that. The cultural social basis uh, for our, our, our people is there, has always been there, because you find people, same families on both sides of the border. And the, the thing was, how do we put the economic case? How do we create the economic basis for regional integration? And that's what brought about Mutwara Corridor. Um, if you're familiar with the map of, sorry, of the region, this is there's Mtwara, and in Tanzania, it's this was all that area going to Zambia, about two thirds of Malawi, Mozambique. I don't have time to present here, but we actually developed an economic model. It's an interactive um, Excel model for what would happen, what would be the impact in terms of jobs, in terms of government <laughs> revenue, in terms of you know, what would happen to this region. And this was before uh, gas came in. And so these were the key objectives that we defined even then, what would happen or what we were aiming to achieve. And I'm not going to say that we're changing that. The only thing that's going to change is the driver, that now we have hydrocarbons uh, which are going to stimulate the economy, which are going to bring um, revenue, hard currency, uh, skills, and infrastructure that will make this happen faster. And for that to happen, we argue that these are the four key principles which must be, uh, which must play together to make it happen in a sustainable way. Responsible leadership. I think that's the first thing, that of custodianship. Because we're talking about hydrocarbons, and um, as Rob was saying in the initial remarks, that um, hydrocarbons have turned out to be, or resource in general, they say the resource curse, you know, that countries become suddenly rich and all sorts of bad things happen. So and leaders, instead of being custodians of national wealth, um, they don't live to that expectation. And smart partnership, that you know, it's not a question of beggar thy neighbor or whoever you're work, working with. It's equitable sharing of the wealth uh, that's been found. It should be social responsibility I want to underscore the word responsibility, as opposed to what my one of my observe um, that corporations can talk about CSR, corporate social responsibility, more actually as a PR exercise, without really serious thought and plans to, to take responsibility 
to be a catalyst for development in the region. And of course, the issue of environment sustainability. Um, first of all, we, look, we, we hope gas will bring universal access and use of clean energy to the people. We're going to have a challenge of waste management. As it is right now, we have rigs operating offshore and they produce all kinds of waste. And all that waste has to come on shore. And so what happens to that? And there'll be more of that when, 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 when industries come in. And um, a place like Mtwara, we have a marine park, very rich one. I had the video somewhere. I thought I'd brought it. Could have let it for you to see that watch around Mtwara. Very fragile, very, very good ecosystem, marine ecosystem that will need to be preserved as we exploit you know, um, gas and oil. And by the way, um, just near Mtwara, Simbati, about 40 kilometers of where I live, is a place where um, whales come to mate. And you find summer beach in, in, in a bad year. So it's even globally, it's a very important uh, marine park. So what initiatives have been done, if you're talking about the corridor, which is the development framework that we're looking at uh, for the region. And I'm talking about region in the wider context that we established been back then national and interstate national and interstate coordination institutional framework and the MOU was signed um, by the participating members in 2002 and in 2004 the president of the four countries that are participating signed an international agreement committing their countries to this program and we've actually in Tanzania because the gateways in Mtwara we've actually started to build highways you know, which are part of this um, backbone infrastructure. And we think before 2015, we'll have completed that. So the oil and gas is just giving um, more impetus. And already we're discussing with potential investors to upgrade them to our port, which is a hub port, airport, and then a railway line, which again is going to link the hinterland of um, to our corridor with, with, um, with, with them to our ports. And the question is, who's going to bring the money? So that's a key word. It's, 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 it's got to be like that. And we believe, in most cases, for the port, airport, even the railway, can actually build a business case that will attract private capital. <coughs> so what are the key risk issues? And um, this is really one to think about. As I say, you get a massive and sudden investment inflow, which distorts the local economy in terms of prices. Uh, the rents have skyrocketed in Mtuara for, you know, for property that hasn't, you know, doesn't reflect the value. Um, then you have false expectations that, you know, there's money, there's money in there, and, and and that expectation or false expectation can be at all levels, you know, from the top right to the bottom. And, and we've also been caught with inadequate infrastructure, capacity, and skilled manpower to be able to participate, to be able to service the industry. So, you know, you get a big influx of uh, new workers, new population coming in. It's got its own benefits. It's got its own challenges. But all in all, you get rapid urbanization and, and population growth. Uh, there are issues like food. Food prices in Mtwara have gone up because you know, all of a sudden, um, demand is, is a hazard in supply. Um, there's a challenge of ending up with lopsided economic distribution impact of, of the wealth. Um, you know, the wealth could end up being consumed in, in, in the capital, in Dar es Salaam and elsewhere, while Ntwara continues to swim in poverty. And I mean, it's happened everywhere. Um, there's a risk of high cost uh, individual and government consumption. And rather than saving and investing in the future, that can happen. Um, we have 
and this is a serious problem for me as the head of government in, in Ntwara region, that we do not have in-house the capacity, and maybe even in the country, to be able to produce an integrated socioeconomic regional and uh, urban development plan so that we ensure there is optimal land use, there is provision of efficient economic services infrastructure, and environment sustainability. Uh, there is a risk when something like this happens, that you have mass, massive land expropriation, and you start relocating people and dislocating people in urban, peri-urban areas and rural communities. It's a make way for investment, but where do these people go? And how do they benefit from, from the land being taken away? Uh, you know, this growth could result in devaluation, destruction of traditional skills, you know, cultural heritage and values, and of course, the risk of environmental degradation. We're talking about biophysical environment and pollution of water bodies. So that is, you see, that's, that's a problem. Um, these are the key partners who are going to make a difference if they work together. You have the government, uh, we're talking about central government, local government, to provide the enabling physical and uh, policy environment to attract investment, to motivate private capital to come in. We're talking about the uh, local communities who are actually the primary stakeholders, living in the resource area, and they own the land. Uh, they can provide it will provide human capital, should provide human capital and labor. The corporations, which are the investing entities, are going to bring equity capital, access to markets, technology solutions, management skills, you name it. The financial institutions, banks, insurance, the movers capital. And that's you, ladies and gentlemen. We need academic and research institutions as being the knowledge powerhouses, as generators, incubators, repositories, repositories of new development concepts, you know, of innovation, and to find solutions for all the challenges that we face. You know, the way forward for any economy is is knowledge. So what are the current energy tasks facing into our regional government authorities? And they say, and the back stops here. Well, first of all, we have to start and maintain the momentum of rapid planning and delivery. You know, we, we, we press to have a blueprint that people can look at and gives everybody guidance where we want to go. The issue of capacity building, this is training people in um, to our regional administration and local government authorities. We're talking about education and skills upgrade, upgrade so that our people in Mtwara can actually participate in this new knowledge economy, high-tech economy. Provision of health services. Um, this is a challenge not only to the population, but it's happened before that somebody falls sick uh, offshore comes on shore to Mtwara and is be flown to Dar es Salaam to, to, to get treatment. You can't have that situation with Mtwara becoming a major industrial and logistics hub for oil and gas industry. Provision of infrastructure. This is transport and economic service infra infrastructure. We're talking about power, water, roads, railway, airport. And marketing Mtwara. This is my first attempt in this. <laughs> Well, in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's quite obvious that natural gas is going to fuel growth and development and will catapult Tanzania into a new orbit of socioeconomic transformation. I mean, that is without a doubt. And that there are a lot of opportunities in, in business, and, but we also have concurrent <coughs> multiple challenges and have outlined some of them. And reality is, there is no easy task. You know, we, 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 we 
quite sober about that. And there are going to be no quick fixes. There are no shortcuts, at least not that we know of. And we don't have solutions that we can cut and paste. You know, it's, it's, it's going to be hard work. We're going to learn from the experience of other people what to do, what not to do. But work must be done. So ladies and gentlemen, these are my final words to you. That for those with the courage to aspire, to believe, and to work hard, Tanzania, and Mtuad in particular, is both challenging and an exciting place to be. And it's my privilege and my happiness to dedicate my life to its future. And I welcome you to join me. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>
Uh, the next set of kind of human organizational infrastructure is what I'd call project infrastructure. Uh, obviously, you have to do a lot of skilling from the ground up, but you also have to build a capacity quite quickly where the nation and the region can participate in the design and management of the projects that will take place. Uh, and where there's a strong safety culture that's built because you're dealing with a very hazardous industry. Uh, and that requires rapid education <laughs> and lots of focus on, on really how you bring together the project management knowledge and the safety culture knowledge. And it involves working with the oil and gas companies, but not just accepting what they say, but really working to set up your structure. Uh, the last one, which I found a bit missing in your slides is what I call the local business infrastructure. Uh, of course, foreign companies and large contractors who will largely hire people who move into work camps will do a lot of your work. But I didn't see any mention of the local small and medium enterprises that are going to, that should be providing many of the services into this industry. And the support will be required to develop them. Uh, who's going to run the trucks? Are they going to be run by a large-scale tender contract, or are they going to be run by hundreds of companies with two or three trucks? Uh, right? That would be a very interesting, different situation where you have a lot of owners who are participating in the system. Uh, there are interesting examples. I think probably the best example historically is Norway. Uh, of course, a very technocratic country and at a very advanced level when they found their oil and gas. But basically, they threw out the international engineering procurement uh, contracting engineers. They did it themselves. Their motto was, we're going to break the contracts up so they're small enough so the corner gas station can build, bid on them. Not quite true. But they worked hard to change the structure of sourcing of services so local companies could be developed. <laughs> Uh, they have a very interesting case now in Canada, which is an advanced country, but they, they found they could not find truckers who met their safety standards. They created a school and created a set of privately owned trucking companies, small, medium-sized enterprises that meet their standards. So a real effort to build the local business community. And of course, tied to that, how do you also make sure the Matoara is the best place on the east coast of Africa to attract international oil service firms, right? So you have to have this be a hot spot. Uh, this has to be the place that attracts the international players, but has local autonomous players who are not just labor, but also providing some of the services that certainly starting at the basic level, but moving up the chain. So those would be my, my three levels of people infrastructure you need to worry about. Terrific. I think what we'll do is, is continue down the, down the row and then uh, invite questions at the end, if you don't mind holding your, your further thoughts, but I, I don't mean to discourage people from doing so. Uh, Balakrishnan, would you uh, sure. to comment? Um, sure, I'm happy to share my thoughts. Um, I, I too find the opportunities that have been described uh, as very exciting and uh, I think what uh, impressed me about the presentation was the thoughtfulness that has gone into thinking about some of the challenges. And uh, I believe you have already identified many of them, um, including the question of uh, lack of capacity and uh, uh, paying attention to you know, the short-term negative impacts of uh, uh, investment uh, that comes from hydrocarbons and so on. Um, but what I want to briefly talk about are what uh, I would call as a typical governance challenges in the case of countries that uh, come across um, uh, large finds of uh, you know, mineral resources or um, hydrocarbons. Um, and there the question obviously is can Tanzania um, somehow become the Botswana in Africa? Botswana obviously is one of those I would characterize as a successful example of a country that managed to leverage its natural resources towards um, its own benefit in a far more successful way than many others have done, not without some problems, but nevertheless, it's, uh, it's a better story than most. And I would say that um, one of the reasons why they were able to do that is that um, they paid closer attention to the issues that others weren't paying close attention to. Governance in this case has gotten to be, has, has got to be gotten right for 
avoiding the consequences of what you refer to as a resource curse, um, and also for capturing development benefits more broadly. Um, and I would uh, say focus on five areas besides the ones that you, you've laid out. Uh, um, uh, the first, I would say, is uh, the question that Don Lazard touched on, which is how do you handle the revenue from gas and oil? And here, in addition to the examples that have been cited, including Norway, obviously, which is uh, a big um, you know, sort of model for many countries that uh, are trying to figure out how to handle their uh, sudden influx of resources. Um, some recent examples of countries that have come across large deposits of natural gas come to mind, which have tried to go along this route and set up a sovereign wealth fund, for example. Um, the example of that I have in mind that I know more about is East Timor, um, which has attempted to come up with a model that would capture some of these benefits and provide financing for longer-term development. Um, so and the, and the second issue uh, of governance has got to do with uh, the relationship, the terms on which the relationship between Tan Tanzania and the foreign companies is structured. And typically that's structured through the foreign con the contracts, especially the contracts for investment and also the contracts for exploration. These are the oil and gas contracts. And these contracts are typically written in a specified form, which I would say following Botswana's example, Tanzania should independently take a look at to see what terms on these contracts are actually compatible with the broader development strategy that it might have and what other terms might not be compatible. So pay, I mean, it's not that countries won't do it, but it's surprising how many times countries think these things are technical and we don't need to get involved and, you know, we'll just follow the advice of people who will do the kind of cut and paste job from what they've done elsewhere. But these matter hugely. Uh, in terms of how you structure these contracts, in terms of both the benefits, but also in terms of the liabilities that flow from the inherently hazardous nature of uh, this particular resource. Um, the third issue uh, of governance here has to do with interstate coordination. And I was glad when you mentioned that you already set up an interstate coordination um, uh, institutionally uh, because of the nature of um, you know, uh, natural gas, which obviously lies in a zone with, where, you know, territorial claims from different states can uh, be overlapping. It's very important to get this kind of thing right to avoid future conflicts. Um, there are, uh, um, the fourth uh, uh, governance dimension has to do with the, uh, the question of how do you mit mitigate the impact, particularly on uh, social and environmental uh, aspects, and here, I was wondering if maybe you could say a little bit more about whether you know, Tanzania already has a national policy framework that might somehow be tweaked or adapted or applied robustly in this area. Because um, uh, I, I didn't quite get the de details on that. Um, the, uh, the, the, the fifth one, um, the governance challenge, has to do with um, whether or not Tanzania already has a national policy for gas development. Uh, and. Uh, regulatory framework for decision making. Because while Mutwara obviously is a region within which the decisions about how to handle the, 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 the natural gas, um, you know, the benefits and the, and the problems that flow from the find of natural gas are managed, obviously it has to be located within the context of a larger decision making structure concerning you know, the policy of the government towards natural gas and towards um, uh, its relationship to other national policies, including, you know, relationship to investment policy and also to environmental policy and so on. And finally, I would say, uh, obviously, from uh, the perspective of uh, urban studies um, and uh, planning, that it's very important to have a comprehensive regional and local development plan uh, and the capacity for implementation, which uh, you have touched on. And here I would say there are many dimensions to it, the most, but the most important dimension, at least learning from the examples of Angola and others, which have seen this problem, is land, the value of land. And uh, I think that there are ways in which you know, governments can be more proactive in controlling, for example, some of the negative externalities that are associated with the impact of sudden resource inflow, for example, and land value, because these are precisely the ones that see that actually end up excluding 
you know, uh, small business people or uh, the poor or those who may not be landowners but were renters and so on. So uh, on that, if the government takes a proactive approach, you may very well come under some criticism for not following the typical, you know, policies and so on. I would urge you to totally ignore them. So that's basically my set of remarks. Thank you. Calestas. Thank you, Joe. Joe welcome back to, to Cambridge. Let me give you some advice uh, right away. Don't listen to too many people. <laughs> so these two are enough. <laughs> and I said ignore others. <laughs> uh, Joe was here in June. We, we spent a, l a lot of time together. And uh, I've been interacting not both with him and also with the, his colleagues back home with his he head of state. And after listening to his challenges, I said, you know what? <laughs> you need to go to MIT. <laughs> and he listened to me. <laughs> so so, so Joe jo is here, and I'm, I'm glad you, met, you made this connection. I, I just uh, listening to your plan, and I've had the opportunity to review the documents you've shared, you've shared with me. It looks like there are really three key things that you need to, uh, to focus on. The, the infrastructure part, uh, the, the physical infrastructure, but also the institutional infrastructure that goes with it, because you can't develop that region if you can't move good services and ideas. Uh, and linked to that is the building up of technical uh, capabilities, especially in the engineering sciences. And the third is the area of, of entrepreneurship, which is basically the dealing with the concern of the head of state uh, that you need to be sure that these resources can help to stimulate economic, actually equitable or inclusive economic growth uh, in the area. And the only way you, you can really tackle that is through stimulating entrepreneurship, particularly small and medium-sized enterprises. And I've been thinking since you are here, like, how do you get started? And by the way, Joe did not tell you that, uh, he, more about his background. He's an engineer by training, uh, which helps a great deal. Um, and he's also, by virtue of having been trained to be, to be practical in the military, he shares that same uh, background with, the, with the, his president, which is so it's not accidental that the head of state asked, asked him to go to Mutuara. Um, I've been thinking about how you get started, and one, one possible entry point uh, is really setting up some uh, institutional structure on the ground uh, which can help you to ramp up the training capabilities as quickly as possible. And I was thinking that maybe having a, the University of Dar es Salaam, which has a fairly good engineering school, establishing a campus in Mutuara that can serve as a, a basis for partnership with MIT uh, and other institutions. And that through that, you can then start to attract people who can help you to think through the planning process uh, visitors who can come here, come there and, and back you up. But I think you need something, something on the ground. Uh, there's also another reason why I think you need to do that, which is to avoid what every other African country has done, uh, which is uh, not connect the resource use with the building up of technical capabilities. You have actually a unique opportunity to do it right, which is to connect it with building up the engineering capacity right from the beginning, especially since you think about an airport, a railway, uh, roads, a port. Uh, these are all areas that as soon as you build it within a few years, you will need to have the capacity to maintain it. So, so you actually need to start building this kind of institution even before you start building the, the physical facilities. And I think this kind of thinking can help you to avoid making the mistakes that almost every other African country has done. We have the worst case scenario being the Niger Delta. The president of Nigeria was there last week with his entire team to try to rescue it. And everybody who went there started to say, my goodness, why didn't we start with these foundational investments uh, at the beginning before we went into extraction? And you have really a really unique opportunity to do, uh, to do it right. And, uh, I, th I think the, I have to say in conclusion that the president of Tanzania 
uh, who is a very pragmatic person, actually pick the right person for this job. Shall we give Joseph an opportunity to respond, perhaps, before, before throwing the, the floor open? Do, now, do we have to be speaking into these microphones for the AV purposes? Yeah. So we, when, we, when we pass it around for and questions, we'll have to do that as well. On the technical capabilities also when there's a chance. Please, yeah, okay. Maybe, just would you like to go first, or uh, no, you're ready? I was just going to respond on the technical capabilities and linking to the governance issue. Uh, I like the notion of a campus that's focusing on engineering, and there will certainly it should focus on the relevant engineering disciplines for oil and gas, but it also needs a strong focus on systems engineering because that's how you hold the projects together and that's how you deal with governance. Otherwise, it's just technical employees and need that overarching knowledge as well. <laughs> well, thank you very much, um, panel. Uh, as usual, I can see Professor Juma is going to get me into more and more trouble, as, <laughs> as he usually finds a way to do that. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to respond to everything because um, for me, this is a learning, a learning trip. So I'm here more to listen than to say to answer. I'll only answer in, in a way of saying what we are already trying to do. You know, in in to face some of the issues that have been raised here. Um, okay, I'll start with national policy. Um, there is actually ongoing now. And when I go back, some of the ideas that I got here are going to go as input. We're actually debating the national policy. And some activities have been put on hold. You say, you know, we, we cannot rush headlong and, and sign off and sign off. Uh, there were people who were pushing for a fourth round of um, offshore licensing, give more blocks. Say, hey, wait a minute. You know, what we have is already enough for the next, I don't know how many years. You're trying to give scale to TCF. 5,000 5, years, I believe. Yeah, but one, one trillion cubic feet of, uh, of natural gas in Twara will give us a fertilizer factory that will produce a million tons a year. So that will solve our current problem and, and our neighbors. And so that's 0.6, 60% of one TCF will do all that. And, so when you're talking about 30, 40, 50, 100, it's, it's huge. But anyway, so yes, the, the, nas the national policy is being debated now. So whatever input you can get, whatever ideas, most welcome. And, and, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll. Mitigation of social and um, environment impact. Well, I, I can only say this is uh, big challenge. Do we have a policy? Um, this one doesn't have a short answer because you see we've we've gone through, I would say, a cycle of of three motions in 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 one generation, generation and a half. After independence, I think we took the route that any African country took which was, OK, we've changed government, was really substitution. But what goes on after is same business, different color faces. But very quickly, um, we ran into a situation where you know, social tensions <coughs> were running very high. Because all of a sudden, what was clearly happening is what the Israeli observed about um, Britain. It's more than 200 years ago. He said you have two, he said, two nations in one country. So two, two social groups, two economies juxtaposed, you know, next to each other. But they're not, they're not interlinked. And so I think the powers that were be at that time said, well, why don't we try socialism with Jama? So he said, you know, maybe we can frame some kind of African flavored socialism. But I think the politics went one way, economics went the other way. 
and in the end, you know, the whole thing came apart. And then you say, okay, structural adjustment programs. Let's reform. What's the solution? Privatize, sell everything. We went down that route. And I don't want to say much where we are, but it's not the answer. So, and during every phase, there was, um, if you like, a national, national institution development policy of how do we develop people. During the socialist era, we had national service, we had, so we, we had uh, institutions, national institutions for, 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 for bringing up the nation. And then when free reign came, that fell apart. But now we are saying, no, 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 no. You know, it's, it's, we just have got to do it right. Um, mix tradition with, with what's modern. So I just take that as a challenge. We don't, we don't, we don't have an answer, but, you know. Um, so, um, how do you manage revenues? There's also an ongoing debate about, uh, or discussion, about establishing a social, social uh, sovereign wealth fund. And the good thing is the person who sparked that idea was the president himself. So it's, it's an idea that I think has got buy-in from the very top. So maybe now it's an issue of saying, well, how does such an institution look like? How is it managed? How is it run? Um, et cetera. Um, we talk about typical governance challenges, I think, um, well taken. Relationship between oil and gas companies. We have something called production sharing agreement. Uh, in theory, it's supposed to work like this, that the oil and gas companies come into the country at risk. They do the exploration. If they don't get anything, well, you know, we shake hands, they go home. If they find something, then they do what's called cost recovery. So the initial sharing of revenues will be something like maybe 70, 80% private corporations, and then 20, 30% state. And once they've recovered their money, then you know, the revenue sharing flips the other way. Now, that's the theory. But in reality, is the fact that uh, we don't know, we do not as yet have the capacity to control and say these are the costs. So the costs can be anything. It can be three times, five times, 10 times was real. And some of the costs are predicated on the situation. For example, the majority of uh, people working offshore in Tuara live in Dar es Salaam. So every morning, every morning they come by charter plane to, to, to Tuara. They, you know, get into a helicopter and fly offshore and come back and go home in the evening. And uh, they live in hotels or whatever. So all these costs, you know, will have to be recovered uh, once the exploitation starts. So people are living now off our money. And they're very quick to say, you know, you can't do this. Okay, we'll, we'll do it for you. I say, but you're not you're doing it for us with our money. And then at the end of the day, we're not even saying this is how much. Yes, you can do it for us, but you're doing it as a labor. This is how much it's going to cost. No, they say, we'll do it for you, and this is a bill. And, 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 and it's not going to be given to a local company. No, we'll give it to people who we think can do it. So yes, this is uh, it's, it's a, it's a touchy. It's a touchy subject. And uh, we need to look again, and especially now, that we know what's there. When you talk about risk, yes, there is risk, but how much risk? It, it's, it's not like 10 years ago when we say, well, we don't even know if, if there's anything. So I, I think you're absolutely right. We need to revisit that. Um, Botswana, well, Botswana is, is, is a good model to look at um, because I think they're the only country in Africa who have managed to negotiate something sensible with the mining companies. Because we have mining companies in Tanzania. And in terms of you know, resource ownership and CSR, I would say they're very bad. Uh, and you know, I'm choosing those words very carefully, very bad. Because 
<laughs> you know, I need to say I need I need to say much more. But you know, you, you can clearly see I. My mother comes from Zega district, and there is uh, a gold mine that's been in existence for for more than ten years. It was one of the first ones to be opened, and when it opened, <coughs> the price was gold was uh, was not even three hundred dollars an ounce, and they were saying that the life of the mine in terms of resources is, was going to be five years, and they would close the mine. So that should have been 200, 200, 2003, 2004. They are still there now. The price of gold has gone up five times. You, you know, that, that's, that's where we are. They're not declaring win for profit. Uh, as far as I know, I don't think they're paying any taxes, if any, very little. The road to the mine is as bad as the one to my mother's village, because the Zegans is in between, and it's about a good distance on either side. My mother's village, where I grew up, and and, and where it's going. And they expect the local government or central government to build a road, you know, blacktop, to go to the mine. Um, like saying, you know, you tax Tanzanians so that we can go and take resources and we're not giving you anything back. So they don't have a very good record. Uh, but Botswana, I think Botswana did quite well. The issue about local business uh, infrastructure is well, very well taken. Maybe I didn't want to, I didn't say much, but. Actually, it's a challenge. I have people that I know coming to my office and say, you know, what is this for us? You know, how, why don't we get business out of this? And uh, I've confronted uh, the companies, and of course, they have, they're never stuck for answers. But it's, it's a challenge we will have, and this is what will create an inclusive uh, development and economy. Perhaps we, we have 20 minutes left. Yeah, okay. we, uh, Asante Sana to the panel and our speaker. Uh, let's let's uh, give everyone in the audience an opportunity to ask questions here. Um, thank you so much for coming and being with us here today. Um, I was very pleased to hear you say that the president doesn't want to see the growth of squatter settlements in Matwara. And if we look at global experiences with creating alternatives to new slum formation or even upgrading of vulnerable settlements, what we see is very much a highlighting of planning processes that put forward consensus building around how to reconcile very, very different or stock contrasts in infrastructure priorities. And so it sort of speaks to what you were just saying about your mother's village and the road. And so the, the infrastructure that we're talking about that is required um, for the export um, processing, et cetera, et cetera, is very different from some of the very real constraints that we have in terms of basic services like water, sanitation, and affordable housing. So my question is really, uh, and suggestion actually for including planning in that campus that we'll have in Matwara, um, is that uh, what is the process that you envision, the actual planning process, not, not the actual objectives, but what kind of consensus building process would you envision that would help ensure that the infrastructure for extant and growing populations um, includes accessible, affordable, and adequate housing, water, and sanitation, in addition to the road networks, in addition to the transportation that is required for the export processing. Because without that, then you will have growth with squatter settlements. Thank you. Sure. So if you want to take that, I noticed you used the word jama at one point when your, your remarks, this villagization. And the, mm -hmm. the, Tanzania has a fine tradition of looking after its, its communities in mm -hmm. the, in a way that I think is unique. Yes, I think it's it's going to be a variation of the process that we have right now, um, which is you you don't start a new settlement, you don't you don't have you don't take new land, without going down. I mean, down to grassroots, and actually talking to people. And it's not it's not something that will be created for for the only for this purpose. You see, the way our system of government works, it ends at what we call the entire level. It's uh, like uh, a street community will actually have a government. And the village has a government that is part of the executive all the way to the top. So we actually have the infrastructure, the social infrastructure.
to sit down and, and get consent and buy-in from the people that we bring this development. But people in Mtuara are asking, what's going to happen to us? And um, just before I left on Monday, I had a meeting with um, the managing director of a development bank, our development bank, which has agreed to come in as one of the partners on the financing side. And, and what we're saying is we're looking at a model where when we take land from a village, three, 4,000 hectares, and we're going to urbanize that, that will not just be a question of telling these people, take so much money and leave. No. The compensation will be maybe relocating, building them uh, a, a settlement with better housing and all the uh, <coughs> basic infrastructure and amenities, schools, etc., etc., but also making them shareholders in the development that's going to take place. So what we're talking about now is creating Mtuara Development Company, which will be a public-private partnership in terms of uh, ownership, and Mtuara Development Fund. And the idea is for the bank, they were saying they're prepared to become corner investors in a fund that will sit on this, I will be independent, managed independent of the, of the development company. And the development company will then be given the concession you, you know, to develop, to plan, develop, and, and deliver services. And the fund will, will give money. But having a fund sitting separately um, will bring you know, market discipline, financial discipline to what, first of all, you know, project selection and how it's, how it's managed, how money, how money goes in there. That's what, we, that's what we're discussing. And uh, I'm not saying we've perfected the model. And I'm mentioning it here because it would be useful to get inputs from others. And they'll probably come back <laughs> to slow in school <laughs> and, and get some. By the some way, <laughs> any of our panelists would like to, to comment on uh, these answers, please, please uh, feel free to grab the mic. Otherwise, uh, Thank you for your presentation. It's great to see that there's a lot of hope for new growth in, in Africa. And uh, my concern in Matwara is the energy issue, because there's going to be a lot of growth, a lot of migration, a lot of economic development. But I haven't really heard about what will happen to your energy supply in Matwara currently to accommodate this growth. And um, you talk about clean energy. So really, what is clean energy in Tanzania. Thank you. Maybe a quick one on that. Um, we have produced a, a document um, called, we call it Mtwara Green City Beyond Tomorrow. So it's, it's a concept of our dream of what Mtwara will look like. And what we're saying is, you know, we won't be burning charcoal, we won't be burning firewood for cooking, for example, that um, Mtwara will be supplied with natural gases. As, as, as domestic fuel, and uh, you know, we'll impose penalties on or negative incentives for people who drive around in uh, you know petrol cars. We want people to use natural gas. So we we have some 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 concepts and ideas that need to be developed. But yes, we 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 want would like Mtwara to develop as 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 a model, uh, green city. Yeah. Well, because that natural gas will take a while to get to the city. Very much so, very much so. Um, I, I, I can't show everything. Right now, um, what's happening even in the rural areas is that uh, solar panels you know, are already very much in use. Last week, I was um, on a tour of, of, the, of districts, and I went to visit one of the new health centers. And they have a dual system. The health center basically runs on solar power. But uh, because it's isolated from the regional grid, they also have generators, which they only use when they're doing surgical operations and they need you know, to operate a huge air conditioning system. So it's th 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 that sort of uh, dual and maybe three energy systems that we see evolving. I can point out, is an area that is uh, subject to a lot of interest amongst NGOs who are trying to uh, reduce 
uh, deforestation. Um, as it becomes developed, more people move in, trees are being cut down. So in an odd way, uh, the introduction of fossil fuels provides a way of reducing that, that rapid conversion of land and the emissions associated with it. It's not obvious to me how, how that nets out in terms of climate. It's an interesting situation. Any, any other questions? That was it. Uh, thank you for, again for, for coming and speaking with us today. Um, I was interested by your comment around um, um, the fertilizer plant, um, which could be a potential um, use of the, the gas. Um, and, and I'd be interested if you could talk a little bit more about um, how the agricultural sector within Tanzania could, could be a domestic user um, of a lot of the gas that comes out um, of, 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 out of Matwara. Um, and what are some of the challenges um, towards using some of that gas for, for local, for upscaling um, local sectors such as such as the agricultural sector? Well, one of the um, things that we, we, we need to do in, in Tanzania, first of all, because of the industrialization that will take place, which means you're going to draw um, socially necessary labor from, from rural communities, that we have to go into a production mode that has fewer people producing more food, not only for ourselves, but also for our neighbors, because um, a good number of our neighbors, even now, depend on food which is, goes from Tanzania um, to those countries. Through the informal channels, the informal sector, uh, a lot of it goes that way. So it, it, it's very important that we, you know, we produce food. And we need to increase our use of fertilizer. Professor Juma has written a book, which you're also using as, 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 as a manual, on what needs to be done to transform agriculture in Africa. And our use of fertilizer is, 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 is very, very small. So we see natural gas. Um, at least solving that one problem and producing other agro um, agro inputs. So, but not only that, um, I think one of the uses of the revenue that's going to come should be to finance the agricultural sector. It, it's one of the things that is not happening, not only in Tanzania but in many African countries, that there is a disconnect between the financial sector, it's mostly made of commercial banks, foreign-owned, and credit policies made over there. And the economy, where 50, more than 50% of the GDP comes from agriculture. So agriculture, which is the economy as far as the country is concerned, is, is not financed. And, and the, the, the financial sector, which is supposed to finance the economy, is, is doing other things. At most, you know, trade finance for purchase of commodities or agro inputs. So it, it's hope. A lot of money, or some money, a good part of money, will actually go to transform agriculture and create a, a new economy with a value chain. Just, I know we only have a few minutes, um, but I've heard, I want to throw this question out to the panelists um, in terms of how you can help uh, Joseph think about some of the themes that I have heard, particularly around s entrepreneurship and the development of small and medium-sized enterprises. Um, Professor Lassard or Professor Juma, if you guys could speak to how this um, area across all the different sectors can really um, begin to grow. Yeah, I, I think that I'll go back to this idea of having a base. You had uh, Joe describe the scene where people are flying in from Dar es Salaam and then they're flying out. So th there are some critical things that need to be done on the ground now to actually establish a base. Uh, and without that core infrastructure being in place, I, I don't think it will be possible even to think strategically about what else you can, you can do there. So I'm just thinking that you, Joe needs a lot of help now, but a nucleus of some kind of capacity to think and plan is probably the most urgent need that he, he has at the moment. And when that is in place, then you, then you can have people who can help him plan consistently rather than rely on 
fly in, fly out consultants. This is not, they just deliver templates or boilerplate reports that won't help you very much. You really need to have, uh, to have people on the ground. And uh, that's what I would see as really kind of the starting point. Uh, and then you can start to think about the connection between infrastructure and entrepreneurship because you, you, have, you are not going to get a business person to come there if you cannot move input and you cannot move produce. Uh, and this also connects, again, to a challenge that Joe jo has, which is that when the population starts to expand, you have to feed them. So probably one of the first areas of expansion is going to be agribusiness. And, and so, so, I mean, I, I think it's going to be, it is a huge, it's a huge challenge, but I think that kind of strategic uh, group of people around Joe in, in terms of just intellectual input is, in my view, is just badly needed. And I, w I would, I guess I would connect the creation of community-based firms and small and medium-sized firms from the very beginning. So you're going to have to provide uh, food and housing services for workers. Those can be contracted. One has to create the capability of the local community to do that on a contract basis. So every step of the way when you create services and infrastructure, it should always have the dual goal of bringing in not just labor, but local organization. And that, so don't wait. As you build the basic infrastructure, you're already starting to build the firms, the or community-based organizations. It could go either way. They could be cooperatives. They can be private firms that would provide the food, that would provide the housing during the week so they don't have to fly down every day on a serviced basis, uh, that would provide uh, some of the transport facilities and maintenance facilities. I mean, so you, it, it requires a planning framework. And then it's a question of, to, to some extent, leaning on the uh, foreign oil companies and the contracting firms to make sure that they are sourcing those services uh, where possible locally. So I keep it together. Otherwise, you wait. It's going to be done by people who know how to do it on a large scale, and then the trickle down will happen 10 years later for the local entrepreneurs. <laughs> question and then we're going to run out of time. I see students are arriving for the next class here. So a quick question followed by a quick answer, I think. <laughs> Again, thank you very much uh, for coming. I'm encouraged by your last um, point there where you had the invitation for all those who are willing and interested in participating in the growth of, of this region uh, in Tanzania. Uh, I am one of those such people who's very interested and I have an uh, in, uh, experience in oil and gas. My question to you is, what is the framework that's in place um, that will allow uh, people like myself who would be able to participate in this development, uh, especially with the focus of providing, partnering with the local uh, entities in Tanzania to be able to, for example, uh, build fabrication yards, uh, to support the subsea infrastructure work that's required, um, offshore training facilities, et cetera. Uh, so I just want to understand the framework that's available now or maybe that we can look to later that would allow us to see a direct path of how we can engage uh, with the local entities there to provide some of this uh, needed investment. Thank you. Well, the short answer to that is that we, you know, we're building on literally green fields. There's nothing. There's no framework. The only framework at the moment would be for you. If you know, we, we, we can facilitate that you come and work with me directly in my office. This, this is what I'm doing now. I have a small team supporting me remotely from Dar es Salaam and, and Johannesburg under the uh, SADC Regional Special Development Initiative. And, but that's over there. My challenge now is to build that capacity in office. So if you came, we'd actually go around and see what's on the ground. How do we put this together? There's an idea has been floated that uh, University of Dar es Salaam and say MIT could actually establish a base. I've already been talking to the chairman of Tanzania Petroleum Development Corporation that why don't we set up uh, 
you know, I coined the name, to, I, I think, to draw his interest. It's the Institute of Petroleum. Not that people go, go there to train about oil and gas only, but it would be law, economics, administration, management, everything that would, 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 would have something to do with growth of industry. And in principle, he said yes. So, But let me take, take this case. So you, you have uh, Africans with experience in the oil and gas industry who would like to enter businesses in the supply chain. Yeah. And the question is, what's the framework for that? What door can they knock on? Uh, and how can they avoid the sense that they obtain their business through improper mechanisms? Because this is a difficulty, right? How do people walk and knock on a door and go through a formal process and say, I can create a fabrication yard. Would you please lean on uh, the foreign oil companies to use a domestic fabrication yard? Mm. That's different than a planning organization. That's a door that potential business people who have the knowledge can knock on. And with that extremely interesting question, uh, we have to conclude because we're about to be overrun. So I would like to thank our panelists very much for coming. And uh, needless to say, also, also Joe, thank you very much, Joe. Good luck.